Hello. So, in this video, we're going to be talking about sort of what seems to be an obvious things, uh, in particular, sort of what are called identities in mathematics, the multiplying by one and adding zero. And believe it or not, it turns out that these things are incredibly useful and will become sort of phrases that haunt you in the future, in future videos. So, to start off with, multiplying by one cleverly. <laughs> so, as we know, sort of there's two rules, which as it turns out are blatant lies, but we won't find out about that in calculus until calculus. Generally speaking, anything multiplied by one is itself, and anything divided by itself is one. Generally speaking. There's some weird things about infinity going on here, but that's not a thing we have to worry about in this class. So, as long as you're not dividing zero by itself or using infinity in one of these contexts, we don't have to worry about that. All right, so why do we care? Like, this is very basic stuff. Why is it important? What's with the cleverly, right? Well, it turns out that if we sort of create one in some clever way using that second rule and then multiply by it, that first rule tells us we haven't changed anything. So this is what we mean when we say multiply by one cleverly. And it turns out this is incredibly useful in a number of contexts. So as a very sort of basic example that you've probably already seen and done before, this would be what we're doing when we sort of rationalize the denominator. That's a quote unquote sort of so-called <laughs> uh, technique, right? So if we have something like 15 over the square root of five, well, if we want to rationalize the denominator, by which we mean get rid of that sort of root in the bottom, we do that by sort of squaring that bottom piece, meaning that we want to multiply by the square root of five on the bottom. But we can't just do that for free, so instead we multiply by the square root of five over the square root of five, because something over itself is one. Multiplying by one doesn't change anything, so we haven't changed anything. So that's the sort of clever step is, you know, how do I get rid of that square root in the bottom? I do it by multiplying by that thing over itself, so I haven't changed anything. And then we sort of unravel it from there, right? So that first step is the clever step, and then everything from there sort of, one hopes, sort of follows along as a result, right? So if multiply across, right? That's just how multiplying fractions work. Then we can simplify, right? The bottom square root of five times square root of five is just five. Top stays how it is, 15 times root five. We separate that 15, so it's five times three. And then that allows us to cancel out those fives in the front, right? So we can we can pull them out, so it's five over five, which is just one. That gets rid of that. Now we're down to three times root five over one, or just three times root five. So this is sort of an example of that, multiplying by one cleverly, albeit sort of a intentionally basic example so that you can see what we mean exactly. As we move forward, this kind of thing will show up in progressively more complicated ways. And in fact, this is a theme that happens through literally all of mathematics, right through research level mathematics, is figuring out what the one to be clever with, you know, how we actually generate that thing so that everything magically works. <laughs> so this is one of the two major techniques. The other one is adding zero cleverly, right? Which again, this is sort of the same, same sort of setup, but now we're adding zero instead of multiplying by one. So anything plus zero is itself quote unquote, <laughs> again, ignoring things like infinity where things always get weird. Um, and then we wanna use that, right? So we wanna use this ability, this anything plus zero is itself to generate some sort of way of getting around a problem. So let's say we have a polynomial here and we wanna factor this thing. Now, footnote, we will actually cover all the techniques of factoring and polynomials in our deep dive polyno polynomial section. So if you don't follow this exactly, don't worry about that part. We're, we're gonna go through it very carefully in the future. This is just by way of example. So the way we wanna do that then is that we are going to add and subtract the same thing, right? Because if I add and subtract the same thing, I get zero, just like multiplying and dividing by the same thing, right? Dividing something by itself is one, quote unquote, ignoring infinity where everything is weird. Don't have to worry about that in this class, but does come up in calculus. Uh, so we're gonna add and subtract some magic number or really expression here. So I'm adding 2x and subtracting 2x. Why 2x? Reasons. <laughs> so that's the part in the deep dive of polynomials that we'll, we'll cover. So don't worry if you don't see why that comes in. You're not really supposed to yet. But 
The good news is, is once I've done that, I can sort of group them in such a way that now this thing becomes factorable, right? So I can merge the 2x and the x over here, or minus 2x minus x, but I don't merge the other two, and that's because now I can group these things and do something called factor by grouping, where I pull out common terms, I get the same thing on both sides, so I have an x minus 1 and x minus 1, pull that out, abracadabra, I now have a factored thing. Again, to be very clear, this is not a thing that you need to do or sort of understand how to do yet. This is a thing that we will cover in the polynomial section. This is just by way of example of what we mean when we say adding by zero cleverly. And again, just like multiplying by one cleverly, this is a technique that is used all the way through research level mathematics. I mean, it shows up all over the place. So this is not a thing you can escape from. It will come back and haunt you in your dreams. So best to sort of acclimate now. Now, next up, there's one other thing that sort of is important about zero and has arguably, in my opinion, one of the cooler mathematical names. This is the actual thing we call it about in mathematics, which is zero is the annihilator of reality. That, that part's just me. <laughs> but we do actually call zero the annihilator. Um, and that's because if we take anything, right, if we add zero, it's itself, but if we multiply by zero, it gets obliterated, right? So adding zero keeps it as is. Cool. But when we multiply by zero, again, ignoring infinity as a weird thing, multiply by zero, it kills it. It goes, makes it zero no matter what it is. So that's why we call it the annihilator. It's because it annihilates with this sort of product. But it turns out that this gives us a very handy tool. And that tool is the zero product property. This is something that's going to be sort of recurringly important and actually is the basis of why, for example, we care about factoring in the first place. And so the zero product property tells us that, OK, if we have two numbers and they are zero, then that means one of those needs to be zero. So on the one hand, it's, it's clear, right? If, we multi if one of them is zero, then when we take the product, we get zero. That's the annihilator property. But it may not be entirely clear the other direction. Like, are there any other numbers that work this way? And it turns out that there's something very special about zero itself, meaning that if we know the product of two things is some other number, we know nothing about those first two real numbers. So as an example, let's say we wanted 73. We knew there was some a times b equals 73. Can we tell anything about a or b? Now, you might be thinking, OK, well, is 73 prime? Because if 73 is prime, then like maybe that tells us that one of them has to be 1 and one of them has to be 73. Well, that would be true if we knew a and b were whole numbers, but we don't. We only know that a and b are real numbers. So we could just as easily have, say, 1 half and 146, right? Or 2 times 73 over 2. These both give us 73 when we multiply them together. So the zero product property, there's something sort of very special about this in that the, the product has to be zero. Zero is a very special number. And so when we know the product is zero, that's what tells us one or the other has to be zero. If the product isn't zero, we know nothing. We are sort of completely out of luck. There's nothing we can do at that point. This is also why, in a lot of cases, one of our sort of first steps is to move everything in inequality to the other side. It's less about making sure everything's on the same side as it is making sure the other side is zero because we want to be able to use this zero product property. So again, I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but there's something very special and very important about having an expression equaling zero because then we can do all kinds of nice things where we abuse that zero product property to then actually deduce some information. Okay, so what do we do? Well. We talked about the sort of seemingly obvious properties, right? Anything times one is itself, and anything plus zero is itself. But it led to these sort of haunting sort of uh, look into the future, right? This foreshadowing of uh, multiplying by one cleverly and adding zero cleverly. And these are two things that are going to come up again and again and again through all of the rest of this course and really all through any course you use that uses math, let alone actual math courses. So physics, engineering, all of those other ones. This is a recurring theme. And sort of the other thing we talked about is that annihilator property, right? This, this other sort of uh, feature of zero where it's actually really important that we get sort of everything on one side of inequality, mostly because that way we have something equaling zero, and then we can sort of 
factor that something or do stuff with it so that we can deduce information about the pieces. And it turns out that only works with zero, okay? So that is that. Thank you.